Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Briz Science. Yes, good, great. I'll take it. So thank you so much for coming. If this is your first Briz Science, thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Joel Gilmore. I'm your MC for this evening. This is Briz Science, the lecture series put on by the University of Queensland, where we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their passion for their work and the latest cutting edge science on a very broad range of fields. Now, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. It's a great opportunity to acknowledge the great contribution that the first people of Australia have made to our understanding of this country, how to care for this land, and the ongoing contribution that that knowledge makes to our scientific understanding and learning today. So, tonight, we're going to get into our topic in a moment. Just a couple of little bits of housekeeping first. If you've got a mobile phone, now is a great time to put it to silent. But do not turn it off, because we are going to be taking questions through the through a QR code throughout the evening. So in a few moments, that QR code will appear on the screen up here. You can take a screenshot of that into the, the URL, and you can put all your questions in there, and at the end of the night, I will get through as many of those questions as I can in the time that we have. Otherwise, afterwards, we have food and drink put on by UQ outside, so we would love for you to hang around, join us, because science should be a social, cultural event, not just something that happens on campus. So we'd love for you to savour both your um, mycology and also your love of video games and TV shows, you know, whatever works for you. And we are, of course, back next month, so make sure you sign up to our mailing list. Did you miss it? It was so close. Um, Make sure you sign up to our mailing list and all our socials for all that information. All right, so tonight we have not one but two amazing speakers. Why do we have this? Well, tonight we are riffing off the fantastic video game that was eventually made into a small TV show with 40-odd million viewers on HBO, a little network you might have heard of, The Last of Us. And our amazing speakers tonight were inspired by this show to think about what was the science behind that show, and is it in fact credible for a pandemic of, not COVID, but fungus to take over the world? So, like all good science disaster movies, we thought we'd bring together two scientists uh, who can, you know, work together and totally not destroy the world. So, first up tonight, we have Dr. James Herriwood, who is a University of Queensland Research Fellow and a, what I hear is a really fun guy. S sorry, fun guy. <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's going to be a long night, folks. Um, he works on the billion dollar questions of pests, weeds, and pollination for Australian crops and how we ensure our industry and food security for years to come. Joining him is Dr. Leela Rizai who is an emerging mycologist, because just like Mario, she loves working with mushrooms. And over the last 10 years, she's worked with a variety of different fungi, not that one, um, in Bhutan, Thailand, and Australia, and is a specialist in pathogens. Perfect for tonight. So um, they're going to present together, and then we're going to go for some Q&A afterwards, and we will see how things wrap up from there. But please now, put your hands together for a talk that is really going to grow on you. Please welcome James and Leela. Hey everyone, thanks for coming to this Briz Science Lecture tonight. It's very exciting to be here to talk a bit about fungi. <clears throat> so my name's James, I'm a geneticist and entomologist working at the University of Queensland. And um, tonight I'll be co-presenting with Leela, and Leela is an expert in mycology, and that just means that she really loves fungi. And so Leela and I have been working together for um, almost five years. When Leela came to Australia from Bhutan to take up a PhD, and I've been fortunate enough to be one of her advisors during this time, and uh, we worked a bit together on entomopathogenic fungi. And uh, before I start, I should just point out that neither of us are medical doctors, and none of what we say tonight should be taken as medical advice in any way at all. <laughs> and so, um, the reason that we're here tonight is this article uh, by Chris Clark at University of Queensland, um, if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to check it out. Here's a screenshot. It was a, a really sort of beautiful looking piece. Um, and in, the, in this article, uh, we had a look at the hit science fiction TV show, The Last of Us. 
um, and tried to separate the science fiction from the science fact. And um, that's what we're going to do tonight. So in the first few slides, we'll have a little bit of a look at what it says in the show and how that relates to the science. And just a quick spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the show and you, you don't like spoilers, now's the time to leave a room. So let's take a look at, at The Last of Us. And the series starts with a 1968 talk show where a scientist called Professor Newman outlines his concerns about a human pandemic caused by the cordyceps fungus. He starts off by saying, viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds, using LSD and magic mushrooms as examples of this mind-bending behavior. He goes on to describe a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, travels through its circulatory system to the ant's brain, and then floods it with hallucinogens, thus bending the ant's mind to its will. He goes on to describe how the fungus starts to tell the ant where to go and what to do and control its behavior. But, he says, it gets worse. The fungus needs food to live, and it begins to devour its host from within, replacing the ant's flesh with its own. But it doesn't let its victims die. No, it keeps its victim alive by preventing decomposition. So this isn't science fiction. Uh, zombie fungi are very much alive and real. And here's a photograph of, of one of these zombie fungi. This one's called Ophiocordyceps albicongi. And uh, the photograph is from the edge of the Amazon uh, near Colombia. And what you can see in the photo here is um, a fungus that's uh, infected an insect and controlled its mind and taken it away from the safety of its colony, persuaded it to climb up a leaf and then bite onto it before finally dying. And uh, what you can see here is the ant with its head bent forward, biting onto the leaf, and the fungus growing out of the back of the neck of the ant. So the, the stalky thing with the red brain-looking thing up the top there is the fruiting body of the fungus. And so this zombie behavior allows the fungus to disperse its spores much more further than, um, further than it normally would. And here's another photograph of a zombie ant fungi. And in this photograph, again, the ant is being killed by the fungus, but it's bitten onto a leaf before it dies. Uh, <clears throat> and also in this photograph, there's a secondary parasitic fungus that's infected the cordyceps. So that's what the white fluffy bits are in this photograph. And the cordyceps has grown out of the back of the neck of the ant, and it's that long brown stalky bit with the hook on the end. And so this paper from 2018 describes 15 new species of zombie ant fungi. The one photographed here is one from Australia. It's called Ophiocordyceps ecophili, and this one's named after the ant that it zombifies. And so in this paper, they also describe how the, the different fungi have different effects on the ants. So some of them cause the ants to leave the safety of their colony and climb up under story shrubs. Some of them cause the ants to bite onto a leaf uh, before they die, and yet others cause the ants to climb out of a canopy and die at the base of trees. Um, here's another one. So this zombie fungi is called Ophiocordyceps nureni, and this one's a local. It's from the Lockyer Valley in southeast Queensland. And again, the ant's biting onto a leaf before it dies. And in this case, the, it's the leaf of a Sorotro plant. And the fungus has grown out of the, neck of the, the back of the neck of the ant again. And this one was discovered by our very own local mycologist, Professor Roger Shivas, who's pictured here on the right of the slide, uh, from Queensland Government Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. So these zombie fungi are very much alive and real, and perhaps partly inspired the show. Back to The Last of Us, and the second guest on the talk show says, fungal of infection of this kind is real, but not in humans. Dr. Newman counters that fungi cannot survive if a host temperature is above 94 degrees or 34 and a half Celsius. But he says, what if that were to change? What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer. So this is something that scientists are actually very worried about, and here's an article from The Guardian earlier in the year that has a look at it, taking a look at this issue of uh, threats to the global food supply caused by crop pathogens uh, as the climate starts to warm. And so the article from The Guardian is based on this opinion piece in Nature where two mycologists described the growing threats caused to our, our global food security by fungal crop pathogens. 
um, as they adapt to a warming climate. And one of the risks they talk about is um, as fungi start to adapt to warmer temperatures, they could start to go from opportunistic soil in, um, pathogens to start making the jump into humans and animals. And so Associate Professor Rebecca Drummond uh, from the University of Birmingham has written a really nice conversation article uh, looking into this issue, and she also agrees that fungi are going to adapt because of climate change. And one of the uh, fungi that infectious disease experts are really worried about is called Candida auris. And this one can withstand temperatures of up to 42 degrees Celsius. And the simultaneous um, sort of arrival of Candida auris as like a problem pathogen in three different continents at the same time has scientists suspecting that climate change may have partly played a role in its recent rise. So back to Dr. Newman, he continues that there's no prevention, there's no cure. If that happens, we lose. And as we get towards the end of the scene, we cut to the host face as the dark reality of this future scenario starts to sink in. So do we really need to worry about fungi like cordyceps jumping and starting to infect humans? So the fungus I'm showing you here is something called Fusarium solani. And uh, Fusarium is a group of fungi that's closely related to cordyceps. Uh, and we normally think of them as plant pathogens, and most of them infect plants, but some of them also infect insects. And here I'm just showing you a photograph of Fusarium solani infecting sweet potato tubers. But this photo is a case of fusariosis in a human patient with a weakened immune system. And so the authors of this paper um, detected multiple uh, hyphae inside the wound, suggesting a deep chronic fungal infection. And they were able to identify the fungus as fusarium but they said that it was actually very difficult to identify it beyond that point, given the means that they had at the time. And here's another example. This one's called Fusarium subglutinans. And uh, the authors of this paper said that they were able to identify it to a species using a PCR test. And if you're wondering what a eumycetoma is, it's a deep chronic fungal infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So in another instance, uh, an Indian man, 61-year-old Indian man, went into hospital, and for three weeks he'd been complaining of a hoarse voice, fever, fatigue, and um, difficulty swallowing. And when he, wo he, he worked as a plant mycologist, so he studied plant pathogenic fungi. And scans in the hospital revealed that he had a lump in his throat, and when um, pus samples were taken and sent for screening, and it turned out that he'd been infected by a fungi called Chondrosterium purpureum, which causes silver leaf disease in plants. So in 2022, the World Health Organization put out a report about fungal priority pathogens to guide research, development, and public health action. And so in the report, they note that fungal pathogens and fungal infections are an increasing global health concern around the world. And that generally as people with weakened immune systems and underlying health problems that, get, that have suffer from uh, most of risk from fungal infections. And the, the WHO report also noted that the incidence and geographic spread of fungal infections is increasing due to climate change. And so in this report, they list 19 high priority fungal pathogens uh, and they group them into three different groups, the critical priority group, the high priority group and the medium priority group. And so one of the fungi in the critical priority group is Candida auris. And earlier this year, the Centers for Disease Control in the US put out a report warning of the increased spread of Candida auris. And so this is a fungus that spreads very rapidly around hospital, um, hospitals and healthcare systems, um, care homes, and, and gen ten generally infects uh, people with weakened immune systems is increasingly becoming resistant to antifungals. And the CDC notes that partly the infections have, uh, have risen because of poor, um, poor infection control in healthcare settings, uh, but also because they've got increased capacity to test for this kind of thing now. Um, and the CDC's report also noted that um, infections had risen recently because of the strain put on the health system by the COVID pandemic. 
And so the COVID pandemic hasn't just put a strain on the health system. There's also a number of reports of fungal infections in COVID patients with acute COVID-19 uh, suffering secondary fungal infections when they have a weakened immune system in the hospital. And so this Nature Microbiology paper describes three different groups of fungi that cause these secondary infections, mostly in the, in the group Mucorales, Aspergillus, and Candida. And so here's another one of a critical priority group fungi, and this one's called Cryptococcus neoformans. And so this is one that starts off in our lungs as spores, but then somehow it manages to get into our brains. And once in the brain, uh, patients com complain of symptoms including uh, vision problems, seizures, headaches, and fever. And normally people um, with a healthy immune system don't suffer cryptococcus neoformans infections. So it's another one that typically infects people with weakened immune systems, uh, particularly people with advanced HIV and AIDS. So do we need to worry about all becoming fungus-infected zombies like in the show? Or maybe we'll end up like this poor person, devoured by fungi and splattered against the wall. Um, well, it's maybe a little bit of an obvious point, but this is where the show departs a bit from reality. And <clears throat> it might seem pretty obvious, but a human brain is very difficult, different from an ant brain. And so it's, it's, um, for a fungi to go from turning ants into zombies to turning humans into zombies would be an incredibly difficult and challenging evolutionary leap for them to make. So back to the show, and in the second um, episode, we traveled to Jakarta in 2003 at the start of the fungal infection, uh, the, the beginning of the fungal pandemic. Dr. Ibu Ratnu is the, the mycologist who's been called in to investigate, and she discovers the fungal infection in the first um, victims. So as the fungus starts to crawl out of the mouth of the victim, Ibu Rattler runs from the examination room. And then we cut to a scene where she's talking to the army general who's brought her in. And he says, we need your help. We need a medicine or, or a vaccine. And she says that she spent her whole life working on these things. So listen carefully. There is no medicine. There is no vaccine. The general, looking increasingly worried, says, so what do we do? And Ibu Ratna responds dramatically that the only option is to bomb the entire city. <laughs> and again, this is something where the show is actually pretty close to reality. So Rebecca Drummond has another article with the conversation having a look at this issue. So why is it so challenging to make fungal vaccines? And <clears throat> so partly it's because um, the people most in need of a vaccine are, are unable to take a vaccine. So because fungi generally infect people with weakened immune systems, and a vaccine normally works by training the immune system to fight the pathogen, normally a weakened form of the pathogen. Another reason is that fungi are, are sort of shapeshifters, so they might enter our body as a spore, but then they grow as hyphae, and it's difficult to make a vaccine that covers both growth forms of the fungus. And it's also quite difficult to make antifungals because unlike bacteria, fungi are very similar to our own cells. And so when we find a, a, a drug to target a fungal cell, quite often they're toxic to our own cells as well. And so it's difficult to make something that, that only hurts a fungi and not us. Um, but Rebecca Drummond does also note in this article that things in the real world are slightly better than in the show. And a number of fungal vaccines have recently made it through to clinical trials and shown promising results. So now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Leela, and she's going to talk to you a little bit more about cordyceps. Uh, thank you, Dr. James. Um, now I will be um, presenting a little more on cordyceps. Cordyceps has become very popular in the show, The Last of Us. But in Asia, Cordyceps has become, is always popular because it is used in traditional medicine. The name Cordyceps means club head, and it is a genus of a fungus, and it consists of over 800 species. Initially, all the species, these 800 species were within the genus Cordyceps, but in 2007, 
based on the molecular evidences, this species uh, split it out into separate groups, such as Ophiocordyceps, Metacordyceps, and Elaphocordyceps. Perhaps the most interesting Cordyceps fungus is called Cordyceps sinensis. And now its name has been changed to Ophiocordyceps uh, sinensis. It is very interesting fungus because it is one of the most uh, expensive parasites in the world. The reason why Ophiocordyceps sinensis is very expensive is because it is used in traditional medicine in Asia. Um, it, is, it is also claimed to be the secret of eternal youth. And in the West, it is also known as Himalayan Viagra. <laughs> However, I should point out that until um, there are um, medical trials, there is no evidence for this yet. <laughs> and therefore, Ophiocordyceps sinensis become very sought after. Currently, it sells for above 20,000 USDA per kilo. So why this is very expensive? Partly because the distribution of Ophiocordyceps sinensis is very restricted. It is only found in some, some part of Himalayas at an elevation of 3,000 to 5,000 meters, and also in, only in some part of some countries like Bhutan, Nepal, China, India, and some part of Tibetan plateaus. It is also very difficult to collect Ophiocordyceps sinensis because it's only the small segment of the fungus uh, um, sticks above the ground. Even the uh, caterpillar, the body of the caterpillar is embedded in the soil under the ground. However, the cordyceps collectors, they, uh, when they are harvesting, they hardly leave any of your cordyceps sinensis behind. And in the recent years, it has been very difficult to find of your cordyceps sinensis, even in those locations. And therefore, Bhutanese government enforced strict regulation uh, for the sustainable harvesting of Ophiocordyceps sinensis. In the mountainous areas of uh, Bhutan, people collect Yaksa Gembub. It is the Bhutanese name for Ophiocordyceps sinensis. It is very difficult and sometimes dangerous too. Uh, with avalanches and floods killing of your cordyceps sinensis collectors. Here you can see the product, uh, uh, the product of, of your cordyceps sinensis, and on top of the slide are the Bhutanese uh, yak harder waiting for uh, their waiting with the with their product uh, waiting uh, for it to be auctioned. Another reason why Ophiocordyceps sinensis is very expensive is because this fungus infects only a particular type of insect, and that insect is called ghost moth. And these insects are also found in only those locations where Ophiocordyceps sinensis are found. Although few of the researchers try to raise this ghost moth in the laboratory condition, but they were not successful in generating Ophiocordyceps sinensis on those raised ghost moth. And therefore, Ophiocordyceps sinensis has become more expensive. And people nowadays, they try to sell all types of cordyceps. This is a Facebook post where a person wants to sell one kilogram of natural cordyceps. But this one is not Ophiocordyceps sinensis. And in the name of Ophiocordyceps sinensis, many things are coming up. We do have another species of Cordyceps, and it is called uh, Cordyceps militaries. 
This species is also found here in Australia, and it does has a wider distribution. It also has similar property to Ophiocordyceps sinensis, and it is easy to grow and commercialize. As Cordyceps has such a reputation, many products are coming up, and uh, uh, there are small unregulated suppliers who are making uh, who are making un, uh, who are making such a big claim on the uh, uh, Cordyceps uh, products. For example, uh, for example, in order to sell of uh, Cordyceps militaries. Uh, they have made an uh, exaggerated claim, such as it can, un it can uh, give you unbeatable stamina, it can also help you to uh, 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 increase the peak level of energy, endurance, and immunity. So, and at the uh, right side, at the bottom of this slide, you can also see Cordyceps wine available for sale. So is there any truth to all these claims? There are many research papers describing the med uh, medicinal property of Ophiocordyceps sinensis, and this paper describes the anti-cancerous property of Ophiocordyceps sinensis. One of the most important compounds is called cordycepin. In the trial, in the medical trial, they used this uh, cordycepin on the uh, cell, and then um, the cordycepin switched to another compound called AMPK. This AMPK did, uh, does have some anti-cancerous property, but uh, some of the cells, uh, some of the human cells also change uh, Cordycepin into another compound called CTP, and this CTP hinders the cell division and cell growth. And therefore, it was not, uh, the research uh, was uh, not complete. To uh, there was no complete evidence to say that it has cancer anti-cancerous property. So there are uh, so further research is required. The European Union accepted uh, Cordyceps sinensis as uh, authorized food ingredient, but it did not accept the health uh, claims on of your Cordyceps sinensis um, because the cause and effect relationship between the consumption of of your Cordyceps sinensis and the corresponding benefit has not been yet established. There is no name uh, for the uh, in the European uh, in the European food safety document. There is no mention of of your Cordyceps militaries. So uh, partly this uh, uh, the, this product. Uh, from the Ophiocordyceps sinensis and Cordyceps militaries are uh, unauthorized food ingredient or dietary supplement as per the European Food Safety uh, Authority. But the good news is we do have our own native species, Cordyceps, uh, and it is called Cordyceps gunii. Uh, it, is, uh, it was discovered in Tasmania, and it does uh, have some properties uh, similar to Ophiocordyceps sinensis, and it may be a good source of uh, secondary metabolite and bioactive compound. So you have seen all, uh, you have seen this fungi, uh, a fungi including Cordyceps, and their relatives are found uh, within the insects, and they infect insects, and they kill insects. And therefore, in my PhD, I studied entomopathogenic fungi, and they are called entomopathogenic fungi. The fungi which infect, which 
which are within the population of insects, which in fact insects and which kill insects are called entomopathogenic fungi. And uh, during, in my PhD, I studied entomopathogenic fungi. I explored their diversity, pathogenicity, virulence against some pests, and explored their sexuality. The life cycle of entomopathogenic fungi consists of two phases, asexual phase and the sexual phase. In the asexual phase, the fungus conidia stick on the um, cuticle of the insect, and it uh, regenerates into hyphae and penetrates uh, into the body of the insects, and it proliferates, uh, and then it colonizes the body of the insect. And after it has completely colonized the body of the insects, it regenerates um, out of the insect body and then uh, produces conidia. And this conidia, or the spore, are actually used as a micro-insecticide uh, to kill insects. And we, uh, entomopathogenic fungi also has a sexual stage uh, at the right side of the slide. Um, the hyphae, which colonize the insect body, uh, re-emerge as a fruiting body instead of conidia. So these are the difference. And you can see that from the ant's body, uh, of your cordyceps uh, emerged, emerged uh, from the ant's body. In order to explore the di understand the diversity of entomopathogenic fungi in Queensland, I collected soil sample across different vegetation types, such as rainforest, dry sclerophyll, suburban soil, and uh, agricultural areas. Um, and I found that the highest diversity of entomopathogenic fungi was found in suburban soil in Brisbane City. That was really interesting. <laughs> and in this photo, I'm collecting soil sample from Parent Park in Tuang. And to my surprise, I found few new species from this uh, uh, so, uh, city soil. It was really interesting, and my, super, my examiner appreciated uh, me for doing that. Instead of going to the uh, field and collecting the soil and doing the experiment, I just went. I just walked with my children and then collected the soil, and I got the great fungus. And I got this soil sample to the lab and then placed three different insect species, all notorious, uh, notorious insect species on agricultural uh, crops. They are called diamondback moth, red rust flower beetle, and cotton stainer bug. And at the right side of this slide, you can see the fungus, the entomopathogenic fungi in the soil severely infected this insect within 10 days. Here, diamondback moths are severely infected. The top photos are Viveria species, and the um, photos uh, at the bottom are Metarhizium species. Um, I found the great diversity of entomopathogenic fungi, and among them, I also found one cordyceps species in the suburban soil in Brisbane. That was so interesting. We have so many interesting fungi just near to you, and we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to explore the diversity of entomopathogenic fungi, uh, I used whole genome sequences, which has got higher resolution than the uh, uh, molecular technique that, that is currently used. Uh, Biberia bassiana is a single species. At the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that all of them are a single species. But with the whole genome sequences, I found uh, there were four different genetic clusters. They separated into four different genetic clusters. 
This shows that the diversity of Biberia bassiana is uh, much more greater than what, uh, what we currently know. Uh, James is going to talk a little more about the genetic work we did uh, in my PhD. Um, and this, uh, this is what uh, the isolate, of, of, um, isolate in different genetic cluster look like when they are grown in agar. The BRIP number is the fungal code uh, uh, fungal code assigned to each isolate when we deposit it in the herbarium at the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. And these isolates are available and accessible to other researchers if you want to do more experiment on these isolates. And in order to uh, identify if these uh, fungi are different species, I cross them in the agar. And after four months, I found that th this isolate did not cross to each other. Instead, they form a zone of inhibition, uh, which we called vegetative incompatibility. And this means that they are potentially different species. And at the left side of the uh, slide, uh, the photo shows the sexual structure of Biberia bassiana. Currently, we don't have sexual structure of Biberia bassiana in Australia. So I explored, like, if I can get a sexual fruiting body from Biberia bassiana, I can also post it and then claim that it has got great medicinal property. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, exp uh, we uh, I carried out the experiment and I could generate some fruiting bodies uh, uh, from Biberia bassiana as well, but uh, they were not fully formed sexual structure. So further research is needed. And in order to test the virulence of this entomopathogenic fungal isolate, I tested them against the diamondback moth larvae, which are notorious based on crucifer crops. And I found that each uh, isolate um, were, high, uh, were virulent against diamond back mode. Uh, and I found that um, each isolate has its own specific temp uh, environmental requirement. And if we are to um, use this fungal isolate as a successful mycoinsecticide, then it is very important for us to understand their diversity. We should consider, the, consider them as an organism. We cannot think like they are pesticide and throw it in the field. It will never work. So we should think that they are organism and we should know their diversity, their ecological requirement, and then they would, they would definitely work. I'm going to uh, share you a little bit, uh, um, little bit on my uh, contribution as an intern uh, with Stephen Rice at Queensland Department of uh, Agriculture and Fisheries. Uh, the project uh, was about, is about using entomopathogenic fungi to control laser mealworm um, in chicken farms. Uh, Laser, the vast number of larvae and adults are found um, below the feed pan and under the bedding litters of chicken farm. And this uh, laser mealworm is also the vector uh, for uh, bacterial pathogen which can cause diseases in humans. Additionally, uh, the larvae and then the adults damage the chicken house, uh, such as floor and the wall, and it adds up expenses. Um, chemical pesticides have been used to control this notorious pest, but chemical pesticides are highly toxic. And this pest has already developed resistance against chemical pesticides. So it is necessary for us to find an alternative 
a sustainable, environmentally friendly biocontrol agent. And Stephen Rice, he found a virulent isolate of Viberia bassiana, and we uh, grew it in the nutrient broth in order to produce its spores to use as a mycoinsecticide. We grew it in the nutrient broth, and then after four days, when the nutrient broth was completely colonized by the mycelium, we transfer it uh, to the rice, boiled rice, um, and then we incubated it in a growth bag for 21 days. After the rice is fully colonized by the uh, fungal mycelium, we transfer it into uh, small plus, uh, paper bags to dry. And after seven days, when the mixture is fully dried, we transfer the mixture to the harvester to separate uh, uh, spore powder from the rice. And this is our final product, the spore powder, which we can directly apply on the chicken farm, on the chicken shed, on the wall, on the floor, and spray on the chicken as well. We can also make it into liquid formulation or directly use as a spores or make it into granular formulation. And in the field, this is how we applied. And in the field, it has it, has, uh, it was more effective than the chemical pesticide. This is the result. The blue line is the chemical pesticide, and the yellow line is the Biberia treatment, and the red line is the untreated control. Here you can see Biberia bassiana was more uh, effective in controlling a laser mealworm than chemical pesticide, and after two months, there were no uh, laser mealworm beetles surviving. This strain is not registered yet uh, or not commercialized, and the research is still ongoing. Um, but uh, till date, the, research, the results are uh, interesting and promising. In the U.S. and in, in other countries, there are many Biberia bassiana isolate which, were, which are registered as mycoinsecticide. Uh, in China, there are already 30 isolates which are registered, registered uh, as mycoinsecticide. But here in Australia, we don't even have a single Biberia bassiana isolate registered as a mycoinsecticide, even though I found the greater diversity of Biberia bassiana in the Brisbane soil, in the city soil. However, we do have um, metarhizium species registered as uh, mycoinsecticide in Australia, and it is called green guard. And it is used uh, for controlling uh, locust and grasshopper. In summary, my research uh, found greater diversity of entomopathogenic fungi, uh, and these entomopathogenic fungi uh, have, has, each isolate has a greater potential uh, to um, develop into a environmentally friendly, sustainable, uh, ecological compatible mycoinsecticide. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to James, to talk a little more about my uh, genetic work. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Leela. Um, that was super interesting. So I'll talk a little bit about the DNA work that we did as part of Leela's PhD investigations. And so what is DNA? Well. I like to think of it as kind of a molecular instruction set. It's all the code to make all of the cells and um, structures of our bodies, and those are all living things. And because all living things share DNA, it means that we, we know that there, we all come from a single ancestor at some point in the history. And that means that we can make a kind of extended family tree or a phylogeny that connects all living things together um, based on DNA. 
And so in this big family tree, fungi and humans are both found in this little green section down the bottom here. And so all of the genetic code in an organism is what we call the genome. And for us humans, the genome is incredibly large. It's uh, th three billion base pairs long. So if you printed it out in very small print, it would take up all of these books on the bookshelf here. Um, in contrast, fungi genomes are much smaller. So a Bavaria genome is only about 40 million base pairs long. And that's one and a half of these books. So it's pictured in the purple on this slide. And that doesn't really mean that much, but it does make it a lot cheaper for us to sequence a fungal genome than it is to sequence a human genome. And so the whole science of researching genomes is called genomics. And right now we live in a, a golden age of genomics, uh, largely thanks to technology. So these machines pictured on this slide here will take very large amounts of DNA and turn it into digital data that we can analyze in a computer. And this process is what we call DNA sequencing. And these machines generate so much data that actually it's sort of like a big data problem in, in biology now. Uh, and we, we have to use high performance computing or supercomputers to analyze uh, the sort of vast amounts of data that these machines are generating. And quite often the sequencing company is, is quicker for them and easier for them to send us a hard drive in the post rather than for us to try and download all the data. So as part of Leela's PhD work, we did whole genome sequencing on all of the fungal isolates that she collected in the field. And the first step in that process is just to extract the DNA out of the fungus. And that's what we're doing here in this picture in the molecular lab at UQ. And so traditionally, mycologists have just used four bits of DNA to identify fungi. And so these four bits of DNA are only about 700 base pairs long. And they all code for genes, which makes them a little bit slow to evolve and what we call conserved. And so what we did as um, part of Leela's PhD investigations was to compare this four gene approach to the whole genome approach. And so you can see on the left of this slide with the four gene approach, all of these isolates were identical. But when we look with whole genome sequencing, they all separated out into different genetic groups. And here's another example where, with the four gene approach, they were separated out into, into two groups. But when we used whole genome sequencing, they were separated out into three different genetic groups. And it turned out that every uh, group of Leela's fungi that we looked at, the story was exactly the same. So here's another example where there was two groups uh, coming out of the four gene approach, but three different groups when we looked with whole genome data. And so, using this sort of whole genome approach gave us much greater resolution and uncovered much more diversity than was previously recognized with a traditional approach. And we're not really sure whether these are all new species yet or not, um, but this greater diversity does open up many more avenues for finding new uh, insecticides, bio environmentally friendly insecticides and bioactive compounds. So like many great pieces of science fiction, The Last of Us gets a lot of things correct and uh, close to science fact. So just to recap a little bit, do we need to worry about humans being infected by fungi? Yep. Do we need to worry about fungi jumping host due to climate change? Yes. What about increased threats from fungi due to climate change? Also yes. Fungi infecting human brains, or well, like we saw with uh, cryptococcus infections, this is also a problem. What about a fungal pandemic? Well, it's a little bit hard to say. We haven't had one yet, but it's kind of difficult to totally rule it out. What about turning into fungus-infected zombies? Well, it's probably not going to be a problem that we have to worry about. But I hope we've also showed you that there's a lot of good things about entomopathogenic fungi. They can provide us with uh, environmentally friendly pesticides, uh, bioactive compounds, maybe even a cure for cancer. And there's a lot of things that we don't know about fungi, and that's also exciting and interesting. And I hope we've inspired you to find out a little bit more. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
It's good to know that the great fungal pandemic of 2024 will start in Tawong. Um, all right, so uh, there is your QR code and the address if you want to put that in. We've already got a bunch of questions coming through. I might get you to come to the front of the stage there so we get a good shot. Um, we're gonna, we got a bunch of questions. Let me turn my brightness up. Uh, let's start with, we've got a couple of questions here going right back to the start about how does fungus control things? So Derek asks how do fungus actually control an animal and Ben asks the evolution of fungi to use insects to aid in their own propagation is fascinating. Is this an indication of intelligence or just a manifestation of survival of the fittest? Can you share anything there? Um, so I guess in terms of how the fungi actually controls the ant's mind. We know very little about that, and that's one of these sort of exciting areas of research where you know there's so much to be discovered. Um, and in terms of the sort of evolutionary history of it, um, I mean, as we sort of saw, there's like several groups of fungi that infect insects like that. And so I think it's something they've been doing for a very long time. And, um, and yeah, um, I wouldn't think of a fungus as an intelligent being, but um, what, what, what are your thoughts, Leela? I've met some politicians. <laughs> I think even the insect is intelligent. It evolves, it evolves based on the uh, fungal uh, infection rate. So um, the higher the defense rate of the insect, um, the lower will be the virulency of the fungus. Um, and then it, I think it depends on both, both the insect and the fungi because they interact when infecting. Um, and uh, partly it could be because of evolution. As the defense system in, in improves, the fungus become more intelligent, I think, to tackle the defense system of the fungi, uh, insect. Interesting. Um, one more, just following up on that theme, we have a question from Melanie. What is the link between the fungus infecting the bugs and biting the leaf? Yeah, so well, we're just asking some easy questions to get started <laughs> this evening. So, with the ant infections, the yeah, the fungus somehow it controls the ant in such a way that it ends up biting onto the leaf. And I guess in an evolutionary sense, that allows the spores to disperse further because it's kept up in the canopy. Exposed. Um, um, but yeah. yeah, it's another thing where we have really no idea how it does that. And it's a very intricate um, sort of interaction between the fungus and the ant's brain that, that causes it to do that. Right. Uh, so you talked a little bit about um, different you know, crossing species. Julian asks, how host specific are these types of fungi? In other words, a species of fungus is linked to one specific insect or multiple species? Uh, mm -hmm. um, there are uh, entomopathogenic fungi, Biberia and Materizium are generalist. They infect all kinds of insects, but among them there are also few isolates which are host specific, like I said green guard, uh, which, uh, which uh, is registered here in Australia, uh, can only infect uh, grasshopper and locust. So we have to find out, uh, we have to search for it. Uh, we have to try infecting different groups of insect and then uh, identify which one is specific. So uh, currently my, my PhD was also about that because if they infect all types of insect, then we cannot develop them as a microinsecticide. So we have to select them by doing so many trials, by infecting so many insects. You know, it's a long process. <laughs> what about the previous research just using one insect? Which one? So, um, yeah, there's a mixture of both specialist and generalist fungi. Um, but a lot of the previous research will just use like one insect to bait the fungi and rather than using a whole spread of different insects. And, and yeah, so it's something that people need to sort of consider when they're doing this kind of work is that, um, you know, using a more greater diversity of baits is going to get more fungi. Uh, yeah, and the other reason could be also like, um, uh, there is a standard for choosing a bait. Uh, in, the, uh, in the literature, they only choose two types of bait. Uh, either it is like, uh, what's called? 
uh, Gallery La Mil Milonella or uh, another beetle. So people do not look uh, anywhere. They use this, they get it, and then they, they use as a bait. And this bait only uh, attract uh, some type of fungi. But in my research, what I did was, I, sell, I did not use this bait. I took some different insects. Cotton stainer bug was never used as a bait, but I used it, and I got a great fungus, you know? They are, they are new to the science, so we, uh, we need to uh, explore, you know, instead of like following what others do. Uh, and in that way, we can get to know different fungus, which may be specific to that insect. Right. Yes. Thank you. Okay, a couple of questions here around uh, the pace of infection. So Carissa asks, how fast is the fungal colonization of the insect compared to the life, the, the life length of the insect? How quickly does a fungus infect the insect? Uh, it doesn't infect quickly because it has to develop first, then only it will kill. So uh, that is the mechanism. So um, until and unless it is fully developed, until and unless it is fully established, it's not going to kill the insect. Because who will give the fungus the food? If it, is, if it dies, then decomposition happens, and it's not going to get the food to grow. So it kills slowly, and it also depends on the, um, the lifespan of the insect. Uh, because those uh, within 10 days? Yeah, the slide showing that the insects were pretty dead within 10 days. Uh, it depends on the virulence of the uh, fungus also. Okay. Uh, all of the mm, trivolium, all of the cotton stainer bug did not die within 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> I chose only <laughs> those dead larvae and then presented here. But sometimes it may take longer than 10 days. You know, <laughs> it started like uh, uh, the fungus started emerging from the insect body by 10 days or b before that also. So it depends on the uh, defense system of the insect and the, and the virulence of the fungus. Right. All right. Um, we're almost out of time. So I'll ask a couple more questions uh, if you're up for it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the questions about magic mushrooms. <laughs> and the hallucinogenic properties of um, fungus. Tom, I'm looking at you. Um, so, uh, question from Jacob. If there are these fungi in the soil around us, why are all susceptible insects not just eradicated by the fungi? Why, why don't all insects get infected and get wiped out? Okay. Should I answer? Yeah. So in the soil, they are in the form of, they are not active. When they get their host only, they become very active. You know, in the soil, they don't have host, and that's how they, they, uh, they live. Um, so they do not die, you know. When they get host, they become active, and in the soil, they don't find more insects. So that is, that is why fungi are, uh, fungi are um, sustainable, uh, I don't know how to explain, a fungi. <laughs> You know, uh, that's why we need to collect them from the soil and use them and make them active and use it as a micro-insecticide. When they are in the soil, they will only infect the uh, insect in the soil, but not all the insects uh, in the environment. So they stay in an inactive form in the soil. Right, okay, second last question. The Last of Us, HBO comes to you and says, you know, we, we, we want to use all this incredible money we've made from this show to fund your research. Um, you know, blank check, what do you do next? <laughs> next, <laughs> I'm going to generate those fruiting body on Biberia Bassiana and advertise. <laughs> And earn lots of money. <laughs> Love it. Science has many pathways. <laughs> Anything that you'd... Yeah, well, I guess, so like uh, Leela mentioned the BRIP code, so we have a whole bunch of 
um, entomopathogenic fungi that are already in the, in the herbarium collection. And um, like the way that I sort of think of it is like we can use genome sequencing to figure out which one of them is different and sort of structure like the subsequent tests against various insects. And um, yeah, that's how I approach it. It's right. all scientists like. <laughs> 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 All answers are good answers. So my final question. Next month, a mysterious fungus starts infecting people in Tawong. We're not blaming you, we're just saying it happens. <laughs> um, the government immediately phones you up and says it's just like the movie. They're getting infected. Um, do we bomb Brisbane? <laughs> <laughs> What's your advice for handling the, the Last of Us 2023 COVID what could possibly go wrong edition? Yeah, definitely bomb it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> On that note, could you please put your hands together and thank our fantastic speakers, James and Leela. Thank you so much. <laughs> but make sure you are back next month because we are, we've got a really fun one. You might have heard on the news about talking about using science for fantastic ends. The people who resurrected a mammoth in order to make meatballs out of it. So we're really excited to be welcoming Professor Ernst Wolventung, who is one of the scientists who co helped create the mammoth meatballs, to talk about that project, as well as all of the incredible things that stem cells do from meatballs to brains and more. So that's going to be a fantastic one. Thank you so much for coming, making this an absolute solid event. We'll see you all next month. Have a great evening. <laughs> <laughs>